And if you like, uh, what we're going to be doing over our time together uh, is actually teasing through some of these things about why ministry, why servanthood is such a problem in the various dimensions uh, in which we face it at the moment, and why the Trinity is a solution uh, in the sense of actually setting before us something that is perceptibly different uh, in all kinds of ways about what it is that we should be doing uh, as servants who lead, are led, and are in fellowship. So problems of servanthood, heading two uh, on page one, uh, first of all. Problems of servanthood. Um, and in a sense, uh, I guess as uh, evangelicals, we might well say, well, what problem uh, could there conceivably be uh, in terms of uh, all this? After all, it's pretty clear, isn't it? This is what the Bible says, heading 2.1.1. The Bible mandates leadership. Uh, it mandates a particular kind uh, of leadership, you might want to say. So Ephesians 4.11, that we'll be referring back to uh, from time to time over, over the next couple of days together, uh, will speak of those word-based ministries, won't it, uh, that shape uh, what a church should be uh, and should be doing, what a congregation should be and should be doing. 1 Timothy 3, uh, of course, uh, with its description uh, of what an elder should be, 2 Timothy and above all, perhaps, uh, in, 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 in some of our thinking, Titus 1.5, uh, which sets out, doesn't it, the kind of person that Titus should appoint as a leader uh, in the various churches of, of Crete. Someone who has a particular life, uh, a lifestyle, uh, someone who knows the truth and doesn't just know the truth at an academic level, but believes it and can believe it in a way that defends the congregation that can correct those who are caught by false teaching and bring them back to the truth, uh, and where there actually is authentic personal commitment to the truths of the gospel. It's uh, uh, worthwhile saying, isn't it, that uh, uh, one of the things that the New Testament uh, wants to commend to us is not just an intellectual knowledge, but it tells us that you should not have unconverted people, either as presbyters or as elder women in the Titus II sense of those who go from house to house instructing uh, the women of the church. That uh, is obviously, uh, in, in Titus's sense, mad to have that kind of situation. Therefore, uh, we need to be very clear uh, that the idea of leadership actually is mandated for us. This is how the New Testament envisages a, a local gathering of, of Christ's people functioning and maturing and being safe and growing. Christian leadership, secondly, 212, is distinctive. Of course it's distinctive. Let's just turn to Mark 10, just to remind ourselves of uh, this truth, hugely uh, kind of referred to, uh, and uh, as we all know, not always so easy uh, to, to deal with. Mark 10, 42 to 45. And the context, of course, uh, of, of these words uh, is James and John uh, seeking the hot spots, uh, so to speak, uh, in the new kingdom uh, of the Messiah. Uh, and the reaction, of course, is, is not simply, uh, oh, you shouldn't do that, but oh, drat that you got in there first uh, from the rest of the disciples, because we know from other material uh, in the uh, synoptic gospels uh, that the uh, other uh, 10 were just as prone to this kind of position seeking uh, as James and John were. But Jesus' words repair tension, uh, don't they? Uh, Jesus, uh, verse 43, called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. It's a, a very telling translation. I'm using the NIV here, uh, but it, it's got that uh, kind of accuracy that um, lord it over, behave as though they're better, treat them as inferiors, all those kinds of, all those kinds of, of, of connotations. Uh, and it's not here that Jesus is saying that there is to be no leadership, of course. What he's saying is uh, that the leadership is not to be a lording ship, if we can put it in those kind of, kind of terms. 
Now, this is, this is something that, that we all, as it were, know intuitively, uh, that we know as, as a kind of very basic fundamental uh, of what it is that, that we think a presbyter should be or that we think a church worker should be. But nevertheless, one of the things that the world sometimes discerns about us is that our leadership is not distinctive. And it's worthwhile, I'm afraid, uh, looking particularly uh, for those of us who are Anglicans uh, at our church structures and the way that authority works and posing the question as to whether or not there is a lording ship rather than a leadership in the kind of way that Jesus puts it here. Servant leadership, thirdly, is intensely practical intensely practical. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, kind of came my way uh, uh, some recent discussions in, in the UK uh, when I pointed to, to John 10, 42 to 45, uh, was something uh, along the lines of, well, this is deeply impractical, uh, isn't it? Um, I was struck uh, by the kind of boldness of claiming that something that the eternal son of God was saying was not practical. Uh, but even there, uh, it's worthwhile just noting that if you're talking about current leadership theory, then one of the things that uh, is doing the rounds at the moment, and I think it's myself, it's a, a, a very perceptive set of remarks, comes from Jim Collins, uh, one of the American writers in this particular area, and he talks about a level five leader. And a level five leader, he says, is this, the paradoxical combination of deep personal humility with intense professional will. Because, of course, if you have deep personal humility, then you are going to be prepared to let others flourish and let others succeed who are below you in an organization structure. And that's one of the problems, isn't it, if you're a leader, that actually you, you have someone lower down the pecking order uh, who does things very, very well, uh, and people start to talk about them as the coming person. And as a leader, you can start to feel insecure and envious. And in a church, if you're the minister uh, and you're dealing with all those horrible people uh, on your church council uh, who uh, don't see reason and all your time and your energy is kind of taken up with that, it actually can be pretty envy-making when you watch the youth minister being lauded to the skies because they're so good at uh, actually dealing with teenagers. And you wish, uh, I wish that people thought as well of me as they do of my junior colleague. These things are very real, aren't they? Deep personal humility and intense professional will. That kind of urge to, to make sure that things are getting better and better uh, in every different area. Uh, and the reason why I say that this is practical is that Collins, uh, the original kind of article was in the uh, Harvard Business Review, as I put it in the footnote, but Collins has written a series of books since then which kind of developed this theme one way or another, making the point that if you want your organization to go from good to great, then what you will need is level five leadership. And of course... Uh, for a Christian who's reading the, the Collins materials, uh, you find yourself thinking, well, the Lord Jesus Christ got there approximately 2,000 years before you, chum. Uh, but uh, it's good that uh, he actually does take case studies company by company and says, yes, deep personal humility, intense professional will. And it's challenging, isn't it? Because... Uh, all too often it's easy to do the intense professional will or the deep personal humility, but not so much both together, which is what we're talking about here. The Bible, of course, fourthly, 214, at the foot of page one, actually encourages submission to leaders, doesn't it? It's very clear. So classic passages would be 1 Thessalonians, Hebrews uh, 13, 17, uh, which are pretty uncompromising uh, in the way that they say that presbyters actually should be obeyed. Just pause there. Uh, and actually kind of think of some of the churches of 
uh, all of our acquaintances. I'm thinking of some of the churches that I know in England. Uh, and as I think of some of the big prosperous churches, and I think of the internal dynamics, I'm not actually sure that Hebrews 13, 17 is being obeyed. Not sure that leaders are. Not sure that they're honored. Is it the first thing that comes to your mind as you think about some of the churches that, that, that you know around here? Lastly, over the page to page two, uh, 215, uh, the Bible, of course, encourages in any event for all Christians humility and generosity in fellowship. So how characteristically am I to treat my brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, Philippians 2, one following, is the model, isn't it, that I am to count others better than myself, uh, and I am to do things that make for peace. I am not to contend uh, in order to provoke conflict, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Bible encourages humility and generosity in fellowship. So by the time we've got to the end of those uh, kind of five sub-points, we actually are covering some of the things that the Bible says about leadership, about leadership, uh, and about fellowship. And it's all very clear. I've not said anything so far that's particularly new uh, or novel to, to any of you, uh, and you're thinking, why on earth did I allow Mark Smith to persuade me uh, to come to this uh, when I could have been doing something else, um, you know? Mark's spoken very warmly of the Jameson uh, Distillery Factory. Uh, you could be doing that in Dublin, for instance, uh, rather than this. 